Thank you, everyone. We are now at the conclusion of our summit and have two special guests to close things out. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Kellyanne Conway, Senior Counselor to the President of the United States, and Aaron Neely Cox, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Texas and Head of the Attorney General Advisory Committee. Let's give them a warm round of applause. It's so great to have you here, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. It's been an action-packed morning here. It's awesome. <laughs> it, it has, and we are so grateful to have you here. It's been a great summit. Um, you have a fantastic audience out here, um, and we've just got a lot of learning and a lot of associating this week. So thank you for being here to close this out. I know you've been working very hard on behalf of the administration in the battle on opioids. and. Just to kick us off and get right into it, one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you is really the connections that we are seeing between cyber and transnational criminal organizations and opioid distributions. I mean, it is becoming increasingly, increasingly sophisticated. So can you talk a little bit about what the administration's doing on that front? Yes, first, Erin, thank you. And thanks to the Department of Justice, Attorney General Barr, and everybody here at DOJ for um, Udom Dillon to, for really just an amazing, robust approach to what has become a poly drug crisis next door in this country. And to each and every one of you, I know we have some of the opioid coordinators here, which is amazing because that's brand new to our administration to even have those positions. Our U.S. attorneys, our first responders, health professionals, um, not just a whole of government approach, but a whole of America approach because at the White House, we refer to this as the crisis next door for several reasons. One is to make sure people know immediately it's indiscriminate. It is in every nook and cranny of our country. It is all races and both genders and every age group and every geographic and socioeconomic and certainly political and ideological uh, bent. And that's completely unimportant. But we want to make sure people know that because that helps to break through the big barriers of stigma and silence. And we, it has been our goal to make sure that when people hear a crisis next door, they know they're not alone. They know what to look for in coworkers and colleagues and family members and friends and neighbors and others, um, spouses, certainly children. But at the same time, they know how to be part of the solution. So on the transnational criminal enterprise issue, uh, they're really crafty, aren't they? They like to stay a couple steps ahead of everything that we're doing as a government, um, federal, state, and local. And they're pretty deft because they are without conscience. And they're about making profit. They are commercial criminal enterprises that uh, don't care about human life. It's very simple. So a good example is, I think, a, well, a terrible example, but a, a, a very present example is that we're in the fourth, fourth wave of the drug crisis through meth now. So 2005 or so, 15 years ago, you saw domestically produced meth. It's, there's no need for that now because it's higher in purity and lower in cost than ever before and predominantly and increasingly produced in the labs in Mexico right over our border. And I like to say if the president only talked about drugs, if he never even mentioned a single person, if the president only talked about drugs, he would be within his rights to talk about stronger border security because the trafficking of drugs and humans over our border and guns going the other way, but the trafficking alone of drugs up through our border, through our mails, our other ports of entry, is just astonishing. Fortunately, Aaron and friends, it is much better now in this administration, due in large part to DEA and DHS and DOJ and others. Um, obviously, our, our federal, state, and local law enforcement as well and first responders. But those transnational criminal enterprises are increasingly using the open web and the dark web um, to do their bidding. and. The reason they're doing meth now, in part, is because it's cheaper and higher in purity, but also in part because of the great response on the opioids. So they were very involved in that, but Narcan, naloxone, overdose reversing, those you know, the uses of those, the prescriptions of that are way up. The Surgeon General put out the first Surgeon General's advisory in 13 years, about a year and a half ago, and it was about the use of Narcan, naloxone, that each of us should know how to use it, keep it on our person, help mitigate. Um, overdosing uh, people, and if you're wrong, if they're not overdosing, there's no harm. 
Uh, and so these criminal enterprises are responding to that. They're responding also to the increased seizures of fentanyl. Obviously, fentanyl continues to be a vexing, deadly, um, tiny little couple grains issue in our country. But President Xi has started to make good on his promise to President Trump of December 1st, uh, 2018 in Buenos Aires at the G20 uh, to schedule the fentanyl analogs in China. We're starting to see some prosecutions, starting to see some punishment and teeth there starting to. Uh, and, but the fentanyl has really been cut down by things like the STOP Act and more inspections of these packages and the, the scheduling and whatnot. So here I are with meth. The transnational criminal enterprises also, we tried to get ahead of this last summer uh, through the first of its kind four advisories to the private sector. And these first of its kind fentanyl advisories for the private sector, Aaron, we talked about um, examining how to look for the money, the movement, the manufacturing, and the marketing of fentanyl that is going to disrupt and pervert and distort and possibly destroy your otherwise legitimate supply chain. So you're a legitimate company with a factory belt, workers, and you've got big pallets of stuff and it's easy to tuck the fentanyl right in and you have no idea. And try to go get your reputation back after you know, your, your otherwise uh, big shipment of legitimate products, goods and services is perverted as such. So we were trying to get ahead of that. Treasury was very involved, which is terrific continuing to sanction um, different organizations and individuals as well. I think when the Department of Justice, uh, quite a while ago now, about two and a half years ago, indicted the first two Chinese nationals for fentanyl rings in, as I, as I recall, Mississippi and North Dakota, and people said, Mississippi and North Dakota, they have drugs there, fentanyl there. It was actually fortuitous that it was two states that people don't associate necessarily who aren't otherwise steeped in the issue or paying attention to it much to hear it really is everywhere. And so things like that are happening. Um, I think J-Code here at the Department of Justice has been fantastic. The joy, Joint Criminal Opioid Dark Web and something, um, the E. And that's been, that's been terrific. So, but we're just trying to keep our head above water, as you know, with all of it. But I also think the money has been important. It's not just the money, obviously. Every big crisis needs its funding and its resources. And the money that's come from everything uh, from the Support Act, which was the, in my view, the most important comprehensive piece of bipartisan legislation passed in the Trump administration, passed with every single Democratic vote in the House and the Senate, including those who have run for president against uh, President Trump. They all voted for it because they all see the need in their communities, even if some thought it was too much or not enough or not what we should be focused on. They all got on board to do that. And there is money in there for law enforcement, interdiction, uh, and surveillance. We cannot arrest or punish our way out of the drug crisis. That's very clear, and fortunately, we have more and more people who recognize that. But the role that law enforcement plays in, again, detecting and paying attention to and subverting the will of these transnational criminal enterprises. You studied the cartels, and it is, it's, that's why State Department is involved as well. They've been terrific in helping us um, and, and marry that up with our law enforcement and our DHS um, enterprises. Right, well, and that's another thing that I wanted to ask you about, because I know President Trump has spoken often about the cycle of addiction and how devastating it is to families. And we had a really wonderful panel here this morning with three family members who talked about how their children had been affected by addiction, what that did to their lives, um, that they overdosed, and then the resulting criminal cases that the Department of Justice took on their behalf. Um, but I know that the administration has been doing a lot on the cycle of addiction, and love to hear a little bit more about that from you. Well, thank you, and uh, let me add my gratitude and my praise mm -hmm. to those family members. I don't know if they're here or if they're gone. We've met so many of them. And uh, it takes a certain kind of resolve to work through your grief in a way that, you, to work through your grief in such a way that you also couple it with resolve and try to be a force for good for other people. Not everyone can do that. Not, no one should be expected to do it. And not everyone can do it. And when I meet those families who are suffering grievous loss, irreversible loss, I met, what, I met a couple in New Hampshire a few years ago when I was there on drugs and um, they had buried their son and they were trying to develop a, a formula that will help to dissolve, to dispose of your unused opioids. Now, DisposeRx, Walmart has that, it's terrific. More and more companies are trying to develop 
substances like that, but here was a couple trying to do it and get a patent for it, pretty remarkable. The cycle of addiction, the president has said, using his own words, that boy, you know, you see one person die from drugs and you're talking about 100, 150 people are affected. And it's true, it may sound overwrought. I mean, that's probably an underestimate if they're in school, if they work in a company, if they're part of a community, and everybody is uh, somewhere, uh, either one of the above or all of the above, to say nothing of the immediate family and those who are affected. Um, so breaking the cycle of addiction begins with telling people you're not alone, and that addiction is a disease, it is not a moral failing. There is help for you. Um, here is where to access it. I think one of the best things that this uh, administration has done with respect to drugs in our three plus years, Aaron, is called findtreatment.gov. It is the treatment locator, and it hadn't been touched since 2000, if you can believe it. In 20 years, it hadn't been touched, and then it was barely touched. Basically, if you were looking for treatment to break the cycle of addiction, to help break it for you or a loved one, and you typed in your, it wants you to type in your zip code, and uh, it would give you volume, not, it would give you quantity, not quality. And many pe most people told us when we were surveying them, they would just shut it down because they're already embarrassed, they're already nervous, somebody's watching what they're searching on their computer for themselves or a loved one, and that didn't help, it doesn't help, so they just suspend the search. Now it's quality over quantity. You can customize it according to your gender, your age, your type of insurance, type of treatment you may need. Is it um, temporary, permanent, inpatient, outpatient, um, LGBTQ customization, veterans customization? Uh, it just goes on and on. And so type of drug. So the customization is really just going to make an immediate difference in people accessing a great immediate tool privately and quickly that can ultimately help to get them into recovery and break that cycle of addiction. The other way we're doing it is by working with prescribers. So something early on that a governor um, told me, and he was absolutely right, is that in his state, the medical colleges and universities didn't, they, they just didn't have enough prescribing courses. It wasn't required. And yet you literally get the pen, that pen is so powerful, the pen and pad are so powerful once you're out as a, a physician of any type of specialty. And uh, there, he's made it a requirement in his state, the state legislature, Democratic state legislature, Republican governor, made it a requirement. And that people are following suit now. And these prescribers are recognizing that this is addictive. The opioids are addictive. Maybe you want to start out with three or five or even seven pills, seven days worth, not 30 days worth. Because the addiction starts, the cycle starts for many, days eight through 30 with what's left over. And then somebody else is using it or it's, left out, and um, I think even education has helped a great deal. So all that money for education prevention, treatment and recovery, surveillance interdiction, the education piece is important because opioids, for example, is very tricky. That tiny little bottle bears the name of the local pharmacy and the family doctor and a loved one. It's grandpa, it's mom. It was legally prescribed to help someone's pain. Legally, you're not in the back alley with a needle in your vein or buying some meth. It's legally prescribed. You're like, well, mom seems to be in a better mood when she takes this. I got a little pain in my neck, I'll try it. So disposing of that early, taking advantage of the DEA's National Take Back Days, which has been a huge success in large part because we've brought a board as a, as a government. And Administrator Dillon and his team have brought a board, Google, Facebook, folks like that who are just volunteering their manpower and their time to connect America with the opportunities to dispose of their unneeded, unwanted, expired drugs and medical devices. The other way to break the cycle is to make sure that we are investing in medication-assisted treatment therapies that works for many people, making sure that we did away with the, uh, that we're doing away with the IMD 1115 ban on, you know, it was a ban on not over-institutionalizing people in mental facilities. Um, but it really has hurt our ability to treat a lot of the drug adult um, Americans who are on long waiting lists and there's empty beds because you will not get Medicaid reimbursement when you fill that 17th plus bed. So I think under President Obama's, uh, as of President Obama's administration, there were about four of the IMD exclusion waivers. Granted, we're now somewhere about 25, 26 and growing and we tell states all the time, get your waiver. Um, breaking the cycle of addiction is also 
I'm sure she talked about today, but our wonderful First Lady, Mrs. Melania Trump, and the NAS babies. I mean, this is something I hardly knew about until I got there. And the fact that the First Lady and the President work on this public policy issue together is remarkable. And I think has really made the difference and saved lives and mitigated damage for many Americans because they put the full force and effect of them behind it and raise awareness, raise money. And with the NAS babies, it breaks the cycle of addiction for a lot of these moms because otherwise they would feel guilty and they would be separated from that newborn. That's not good for the newborn, it's not good for the mother. So investing in that way and saying, it's all right, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to figure this out. And then investing on the longitudinal research into those children who are born already chemically dependent. We're just starting to see the eight, nine, ten-year-olds in their development. So it really is the education and prevention. It is the surveillance and I say on the, to answer your question about breaking the cycle of addiction, it's the education and prevention, but it's also the treatment and recovery. And just being able to talk about it. I mean, this is something that's been a little taboo, but it's also been something where people say, yeah, I keep reading opioid. I now know how to spell it. I keep reading naloxone. I keep reading about this. I'm sure I know somebody who knows somebody, but they don't know the one, two, threes. You know, starting at the beginning has really made a big difference. Well, and we heard about that from some of the family members that, you know, they learned to understand the addiction and to not be, not to think that it was just a lack of discipline that um, would allow their children to go back into drug using. I mean, that, that, those kind of stories are so powerful for us to hear. One I should have mentioned, Erin, is the, what the CARE Act and the CAREER Act have done as well, and our own Department of Labor has invested over $100 million and counting in dozens of states in displaced worker grants. This is huge, because we all know that if you are fortunate enough to come through one of those drug court programs or a drug treatment program, and obviously you're still in recovery, but you're ready to reassimilate into society and you want to, where's the job? Where's the skills training? Where's the education? Where's the housing? So in our opioids cabinet, we have the usual cabinet agencies you would expect, like DOJ and its adjuncts, HHS and its adjuncts, DHS, VA, state, but we also have state we also have USDA for rural America. We also have Department of Labor and HUD. We're not handing out apartments and jobs, but we are connecting people with those opportunities. We have 7.1 million available jobs, more people than, more jobs than people looking for jobs. But a lot of the folks looking for jobs, Aaron, are coming out of prison, are coming out of recovery, or in recovery, I should say. And we are increasingly connecting them with that. These displaced worker grants help to restore that livelihood and the dignity that goes along with it. Um, otherwise, people go back to what's familiar to them, the drugs. They go back right to what was familiar to them. And that really has been a terrible way to keep the cycle of addiction going rather than pull back on it. And we really, you know, I think you've got a crowd of U.S. attorneys and opioid coordinators. And I think uh, for the first time, we've been encouraged um, and empowered to go out there and really speak to different stakeholders and try to continue this education process. I mean, I think. Uh, because of the administration, you do see a whole of government approach where everyone that has a connection to it is coming out and trying to educate. I mean, I know for myself, I I'm really encouraged by some of my prosecutors doing, you know, uh, speeches at school middle schools and schools to just talk about um, hopefully veering kids away from this. And that was why it was so nice to hear from the First Lady this morning about the work that she's doing with both the infants and the older kids to keep kids away from these addictive drugs. She is, and you have to start it early, as we all know. And um, there are some good analogies that we've seen in society if we just talk to kids and some of it is education, some of it is fear. I think when you talk about meth, I mean, one thing that's even, um, Administrator Dillon has been there to witness it as well, one thing that is very compelling to the president is when he sees these pictures of people who are on meth. Um, and it's compelling to the president, it's compelling to everyone. You don't see that with opiate use necessarily. And you don't see that with some of these other, um, I'd say insidious drug uses where people can just, you know, hide it a little bit better. And with meth, I thought uh, Utah had this great public relations campaign a few years ago. It was a public service announcement, and I, I really think we should replicate it at the federal level if we can. Uh, and it just basically, there was a girl at a party coming out of a rancher down a hill, a bunch of people congregating there, and she's like, hey, you know, obviously they were, I don't know if they were drinking or smoking or whatnot, but she said, hey, where's mine? 
and we don't even know as the audience what the mine is, what she's talking about that she wants so desperately. She's like, hey, where is mine? They said, you want some? Great. Here's your meth, and here's your meth dealer. You know, some guy strong arming here. Here's your meth boyfriend. You know, he's all strung out. Here's your meth face, you know, and here's your meth baby. And it's just like, bing, bang, boom. <laughs> and it's very, very yeah. um, jarring in a way that some of these other drug uses cannot be as jarring. But speaking of the, the work that we did with the Ad Council and with the Truth Initiative, our major public relations campaign, that they were terrific partners to work with. I mean, the Ad Council, obviously 76 years old, right. Smokey the Bear, friends don't let friends drive drunk, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And the Truth Initiative, which really has helped all but cease youth smoking of cigarettes anyway, combustibles, more on that in a different panel. And uh, they're smoking all kinds of things, I suppose. And so they were terrific, and we generated 1.5 um, billion views of this material, and 58% of the target market viewed them. We even got an Emmy for the long-form uh, version of the ad. And it really was showing somebody in what we call the detox box. Um, she agreed to replicate what it was like to detox over all those days with the sweating and the, 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 the just hallucinating. And, um, and then we had a number of ads that really shocked the conscience so that youth would see this. And that is trying to stop addiction from starting and also trying to stem the cycle for other people. Well, it's so great to hear about it. And just uh, as we wrap up, I just wanted to ask one final question about, you mentioned the opioid cabinet. I mean, we've certainly seen uh, the website uh, have a really positive effect. Even some of the people today talked about how years ago they would try to find um, where, where to go, where to take their addicted children, and that there's just no way to navigate that. So I, I do know, you can know from this uh, summit today that people are talking about how they're using that. But just as we wrap up the summit and close out today, if you just want to give any final words from what you, you are doing in the opioid cabinet, such important work. Well, thank you. Let me even explain what it is. It's called the opioid cabinet. In the Trump White House, we had had one, only one prior to that. It was really the tax, uh, tax Cut and Jobs Act cabinet. In other words, trying to push that legislation through. And essentially, the opioid cabinet exists so that I'm a coordinator and a communicator and, and, and all of that. But there was such great work being done and such great such great ambition all pent up saying, gee, we really want to break the back of this in our administration. We have this idea and that idea and this idea. And we started to realize that Secretary Purdue and the USDA was going to go out to rural America, Department of Interior is going to go out to tribal America, um, DOJ and all of its adjuncts was doing amazing work, everyone from the CDC to the FDA to the NIH to SAMHSA, obviously under HHS, amazing work. Um, Veterans, I had gone out to um, the veterans clinic in Cleveland, not the Cleveland clinic, across the street, the veterans clinic, to see how they are managing pain, but they're saying pain management need not mean pain medication for our veterans. And they try all these things I've never tried and should, um, Reiki, yoga, um, acupuncture. And Secretary Wilkie, who's there now at the VA, says, his father was, you know, this big strapping guy who fought in the wars, and the idea that you would have told him to get some Reiki, yeah. or, or however you pronounce it, yoga meditation, <laughs> but it's working for so many of these veterans. Now some will have to take the pain medication. So we started to just see that pe that departments and agencies that the public may not intuitively think would be involved in solving the drug crisis were involved in solving the drug crisis. And so what we did is just trying to convene them all together, and I think the consistency. And I will say a little bit of the Jill Sargent in me of the, what did you produce this week? What are you doing next week? Where's your cabinet? Where, where's your member, your head going? Where's your, and encouraging them to be involved and making sure that their piece of the solution is as represented as the law enforcement interdiction piece or the Department of Ed piece in the curricula, et cetera. And it has been remarkable. And it has inspired so much private sector partnership the, the big drug company, the, well, some of the pharmaceuticals, but most importantly, the chain drug stores, the community pharmacists, the Walmarts, um, the Amazon is very involved, Microsoft, very, very involved. Google has probably close to 20 people on a team now dedicated 
to they started out for take back day literally connecting America with thousands and thousands of sites. It went from about 2,200 sites the first time they did it to over 6,000 the next time. So it's almost tripling it and growing. So that when you type it in, you know where to go. Um, Department of Transportation is involved because the National Safety Council ran this fantastic ad campaign called Drugged Driving. I'm 53, my mother said don't drink and drive, and she said don't smoke. Um, she knows, even though she smoked while she was pregnant, thanks mom, I love you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so she said don't smoke and don't drink and drive, but she never said don't smoke and drive, <laughs> you know, never, there was no drug driving. And the National Safety Council will take your unused drugs all year long. You don't have to wait for the last Saturday in April, October. So we just saw literally, literally every department and agency has a place there. And I think it's the consistency of meeting and the consistency of communicating and empowering them. And I said from the beginning, I do not want this to be the Kellyanne show, so I pushed it out. I didn't talk about it for a very long time. I pushed it out to the departments and agencies, and they bring it back in, and then when appropriate, we bring it to the president, the vice president, the first lady, the second lady. And that's really, I think, just as a model, been incredibly, um, I incredibly consequential to supporting all the work that you're doing. This is a piece of my portfolio. You're doing it every single day on the front lines. And I know it's great to have an administration that respects you and resources you, but it's really even beyond that. I mean, that's, it's that plus. It's actually saying, give us the numbers. You know, we came, we brought, we like to bring people to the White House, for example, to shine a light on them who, obviously the families, the survivors, the healthcare professionals who were working on HIV 30 or 35 years ago are now turning to this or worked on heroin and now turning to, I mean, they're just amazing, the face-based employers. but. We, we highlighted, for example, a state trooper from Nebraska who just randomly sees, stopped, stopped a vehicle or stopped a tractor trailer. It happened again in Maryland not long after that, same situation. A state trooper stops a, a vehicle that's transporting enough fentanyl in the middle of the day to have killed 26 million Americans, 32 million Americans. And we just bring this one state trooper up there to say, look, look at what all of you are doing with your prosecutions, with your interdict, but one person saying, you know, I think if I do this, I get support. Nobody's gonna say, you're a xenophobe, you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a, you hate tractor trailers. Um, <laughs> with Wisconsin license plate, it's just weird. So he's like, I think I'll stop this tractor trailer. And so we like to shine those stories as well. And people are just coming up and saying, I wanna start my own treatment program, how do I do that? I want to volunteer, where do I do that? And it's really been terrific. We also have um, increasingly, it's a little bit of a slow slog because it's not a big priority, but I mean, I, I happen to be at that game, game three or four of the World Series here where Major League Baseball played the DEA take back ad um, in, you know, in the eighth, seventh or eighth inning. There I was with my 15 year old son and I thought this is just so cool to see this. Uh, the Nationals lost, but the people brought their drugs back. It was perfect. Um, the NFL, has put out the advisory to all of its teams. Some do get more involved than others, but they use breast cancer as a little bit of a model. Obviously, that's much bigger, but they say, you know what, we're still going to do that every October, but hey, why not get involved in this? And then it, and then it mushrooms. They call us and say, do you have any brochures? What do you tell the families? What do you tell the players? What do you tell the um, LEIDOS, which is L-E-I-D-O-S. They've been a terrific partner, and they represent a number of uh, different enterprises, but they also are very connected to the capitals and wizards here at home who love putting up the material. And it's not easy, Erin, because it's kind of a sad topic, and these sports enterprises are trying to get people there for happiness and joy. But they recognize that they are trusted by their fan base, and people will say, you know what? Uh, yeah, I gotta go check grandmom's medicine cabinet. So the opiate cabinet is meant to coordinate and collaborate, and I have to really just give a huge shout out to the members of it because they show up and they produce. And we have guest speakers. We recently had Facebook in, um, and, I, and, we, and we're having, um, who's coming in this time? Oh yes, oh yes, um, Mr. Barksdale, who's like the US Postal Inspector and went over to China with Jim Carroll and a few others. Um, Udom, were you on that trip to China? You've been, anyway, they went to China. So just to hear the U.S. Postal Inspector say how different it is now through the Stop Act, which is part of the HR6. I mean, we have a 100% goal, but we're at 20, in the late 30, 20s, I think, or in some places, um, early 30 percentile 
work on our way going from like 2% up where you know, just the way we've compelled the third party car carriers forever, we're now compelling our own US Postal Service, sender, recipient, contents. And so we're looking at these foreign origin packages more and uh, that's really, I think, helped a great deal because it's difficult to keep up with it. Absolutely. Well, um, I know we all thank you for your behind the scenes commitment to the opioid crisis and to pulling all these various stakeholders together. And you've got a lot of great ambassadors in this audience today to help on that front and very committed to it. Yes, so. I came to speak and answer your questions, Aaron, and be with you. But I really came um, on behalf of the president and, and the administration to thank each and every one of you for what you're doing on the front lines every day. Keep it up. It's working. I mean, that's the most important thing to say. Something is working. A lot of things are working. And we will continue to fight this. It's, we didn't get here overnight. We won't get out of it overnight. That goes without saying. And these battleships turn slowly, but we feel like they're headed in the right direction at whatever pace they're going. And we'll continue to keep on pushing forward on those three major fronts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Kellyanne and Aaron for those comments. That was a great conclusion to the summit. Um, we are now done with the massive two and a half day summit. I appreciate everyone's patience in, in making it through it. Two quick reminders, if people could drop their security badges on the way out. And those of you that are registered, you will be getting an email from Doreen um, next week about CLE credits. Um, I hope all of you were able to sort of pull out some tools from the summit this week that you can implement in your own districts. Um, and thank you all for your participation. Thanks. Thank you.